So today I'm going to talk, I was asked to talk about three things. One is, when you eat good food or good tasting food, does it activate reward circuitry? Two, are there individual differences in how our brains respond to food stimuli and intake of food? And then three, is there anything we can do to sort of maybe uh, modulate or correct kind of um, abnormal responsibility, um, responsivity to kind of food that may uh, increase risk for overeating? Uh, first, disclosures. Um, uh, most of our work's been uh, supported by NIH, the U.S. NIH, and uh, I hold a couple positions and serve on a couple boards, but I don't think there's any obvious conflicts. Um, so all of us know that obesity affects a lot of people, theoretically it kills about 300,000 people a year, shortens the lifespan by about seven years. Um, the medical costs are extreme, and unfortunately most of the obesity prevention and treatment interventions don't really produce long-term um, healthy weight that persists over time. So we uh, hopeful, or are hopeful that an improved understanding of the risk factors that predict future weight gain from a neuro neurobiological standpoint can inform the design of better prevention and treatment interventions. So palatable food intake, when you eat a donut, like they have in the back of the room, uh, it activates brain reward circuitry, uh, the midbrain, striatum, et cetera. It also causes um, dopamine release in these reward regions. And technically, dopamine is about reward learning, not actually reward. Um, that's more opioids, but they're all tightly inter, uh, related, so you can't separate them out very much. And we know that the degree of striatal activation and dopamine signaling correlates with food pleasantness. So drugs of abuse also activate these same reward regions and cause elevated dopamine signaling. The one qualitatively different or big difference between drugs and food is when you eat a donut, you just get the regular phasic signaling of dopamine, whereas when you do something like cocaine, it affects the dopamine reuptake system and you basically have an artificial prolongation of that dopamine signaling. So they are really qualitatively different in that regard. And all drugs of abuse in some way, shape, or form artificially uh, improve or amplify dopamine signaling. Um, high fat, high sugar foods are particularly good at activating reward circuitry. Um, and interestingly, um, us and a couple other research groups really expected an interaction between you know, salt, uh, fat, and sugar, or at least fat and sugar. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of interaction. It seems like some of each is good, but uh, there's no synergistic effect. Um, so these are some of the brain regions that you'll hear about today, um, which I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time on. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, this is your brain on chocolate milkshake. So we, uh, in this study we had, and a lot of times people criticize brain imaging work because they're small sample sizes. This is 162 adolescents, and we gave them chocolate milkshake versus uh, tasteless solution, which is an iconic cocktail that's uh, supposed to be uh, mimic saliva taste, because that's our control condition. Um, and as you can see, it activates almost the entire striatum, and Interestingly, it also activates oral somatosensory and gustatory regions, which are also important players in this. Um, that those themes will come up repeatedly, but it really activates a lot of your brain. It's it's really powerful in that sense. So um, you might be wondering wh whether fat or sugar is more effective in activating reward circuitry. Um, we re recently did a study where we gave people chocolate milkshakes that varied systematically in fat and sugar content. And the box uh, labeled A shows you what brain regions are more activated by sugar versus fat. And we get really nice caudate effects there. Um, B shows what act regions are activated more by the high, or high fat milkshake versus the high sugar. And it turns out a lot of the um, the gustatory regions are activated more with regard to that. And it turns out we have taste buds for sweetness, but not for fat. Um, we encode fat just from the viscosity of the oral somatosensory regions. But you know, the long and short of this particular study was sugar seemed to beat out fat in terms of activating or recruiting reward circuitry. Um, so the, in terms of two theoretical models that guide a lot of the work in this field, the reward surfeit model posits that people who have more responsive reward circuitry eat more. So in other words, if all of us eat a donut, um, those of us who experience more activation and reward circuitry are more likely to eat more donuts. So it, it makes sense. The incentive sensitization model is a slightly more complex theory, but it holds that hyper-responsivity of reward regions to food cues 
cause craving and overeating. So if you start a career at eating at McDonald's, when you see a McDonald's television commercial, it'll remind you of that pleasure and it'll serve as a cue that induces um, craving and, and desire to eat that kind of food. So this is the important distinction there is that the reward surface surfeit model is inborn. It's a biological predisposition predisposition that we start with, whereas the incentive sensitization is acquired. So you have to have a period of overeating energy dense foods to learn what cues predict reward from those foods. Okay, so what do we know? Um, so there's been a lot of studies that have looked at how our brains respond to pictures of palatable foods. I'm not entirely sure this is very useful because nobody gets fat from pictures, but maybe they do. Um, but for sure, obese and individuals versus lean individuals show greater responsivity of brain regions that are really reward valuation regions that say, yeah, yeah, that's right, I like chocolate or whatever. Um, and this is in response to palatable food images versus various types of control images like vegetables or other types of control images. So this is a, a highly, there's actually way more sites than I could fit on the slide. Um, the other thing we know is, and this is sort of closely related to it, is as people anticipate receiving chocolate milkshake in the brain scanner, we see the exact same thing. So if we show them a neutrally paired geometric shape that says you're about to get chocolate milkshake, we see the same reward regions activate. And something like this is germane. So if you're sitting at a restaurant looking at a menu, this is what's happening when you, you know, read over something that, that is unhealthy but looks really tempting or uh, attractive. So we see elevated reward circuitry response for obese versus lean. It's interestingly, we even find that kids are overeating. We use doubly labeled water to assess uh, total energy intake in a biologically objective way. And the kids who are already overeating but aren't yet overweight, because you've got to overeat for a while before you get overweight, um, they even show hyper-responsivity of the same reward regions to anticipated receipt of food. So it's an evolutionary process, and we're trying to capture the different phases of it. Um, now, on the whole point of addiction, I actually don't want to go on record as saying a particular food is addictive, but I think that's sort of, we're asking the wrong question, because if, you know, we think of like the quintessential thing that people are addicted to, like cigarettes, 70% of people who try smoking cigarettes never become addictive. So it's really about individual difference factors that determine who gets sucked into the vortex of habitual use of drugs or uh, eating unhealthy foods. Um, but drugs of abuse, Basically, people who use drugs and alcohol on a regular basis show hyper-responsivity in the same brain reward regions that we see, um, you know, obese individuals showing the food cues, but, you know, when you show an alcoholic, uh, you know, a glass of alcohol or a cocaine addict, um, a razor blade in a mirror, which is associated with use, um, they show hyper-responsivity of the same reward circuitry that's implicated in obesity to food cues. Um, now, why is this important? Well, it's important because it predicts future weight gain. So people who show greater reward region response to palatable foods uh, gain more weight over time, even to geometric shapes that predict the receipt of palatable foods. So this is a very general effect. Um, and in terms of an ecologically valid test, we um, took a, a television show, Mythbusters, and inserted healthy and unhealthy food commercials um, and other control commercials. And basically, the, the kids, the teenagers who showed the greatest activation of COD-8 and kind of striatal regions to unhealthy food commercials gain more weight over the subsequent year. So neural responsivity to kind of unhealthy food commercials in the context of a real TV program even predicts future weight gain. Um, interestingly, that the relation between kind of reward region response to food cues and future weight gain is stronger for kids with a genetic propensity for greater dopamine signaling capacity. I won't bore you with it, but basically we've come up with a, a multi-locus score that reflects um, five different genotypes that have been linked to greater signaling capacity. And the more uh, reward circuitry response you show to food cues, um, the, and the more you have a, a genetic risk for uh, greater dopamine signaling capacity, the more weight gain you show in the future. So there's clear biology going on here. Um, and a lot of you are probably aware of the fact that a lot of the genetic findings that have been out there have not replicated in independent studies. Um, and I just wanted to show you that in three different samples, we find that kids with higher genetic um, capacity or genetic vulnerability to dopamine signaling capacity gain uh, greater weight in the future in three different samples. So it seems like a very robust finding. Um, in terms of other prospective effects, there's even evidence that how much your brain responds to receipt of high sugar, high sugar and fat foods predicts future weight gain. So it doesn't seem to be restricted to pictures or images of palatable food. 
So collectively, the results seem to provide nice behavioral support for the reward surfeit and the incentive sensitization model of obesity. But right now, very little is known about individual difference factors that determine for whom people will develop hyper-responsivity uh, of reward regions to food cues, suggesting that there's really important individual differences in reward learning that may set the stage for hyper-responsivity to food cues in future weight gain. So hold that thought. Um, so on the other side, um, it's important to distinguish between anticipatory and consumatory food reward. Um, so we know from a lot of animal studies that dopamine signaling initially occurs when you first taste the donut. Um, but that after repeated taste of that same donut, your dopamine signaling actually occurs in response to cues that predict that you're about to eat donuts rather than to the donut itself. In fact, the dopamine signaling to consumption of the food goes down over time. It's sort of a, a curious thing about reward learning. So the repeated intake, dopamine signaling to taste it decreases, but dopamine signaling to predictive cues increases. So any simple model of up or down um, probably isn't going to really square with all the data. Um, but in terms of this, response to receipt, we do know that obese versus lean humans show fewer dopamine D2 receptors and that we see the same thing with rats. Um, and this has led uh, Jean Jack Wang and Noah Volkov to posit that people overeat to compensate for a reward deficit. And there's been a lot of interest in this whole model um, that's completely opposite of all the findings that I presented earlier. Um, so this is a picture of your brain, uh, well not your brain, but uh, if you look at what happens for obese versus lean individuals, um, they show less activation in the caudate and the patamen and nucleus accumbens in response to palatable food tastes. Um, this finding, too, is replicated in a number of independent labs, so it seems pretty robust. Um, but the question is whether overeating leads to this or whether it's an initial vulnerability. Um, so we know from animal studies that overeating leads to downregulation of dopamine D2 receptors, reduced D2 sensitivity, and less reward sensitivity in animals. And it applies that overeating contributes to this blunted reward region response. Um, so far, there was no evidence of human studies, though. So we uh, decided to compare a straddle response to chocolate milkshake receipt for women who gained weight, stayed weight stable, or lost weight over a six-month period. And somewhat, or exactly lining up with the animal studies is basically the women who gained weight showed this dramatic drop in how much her, their striatum was recruited when they taste chocolate milkshake in the scanner, whereas the people who stayed weight stable or lost weight um, didn't show a significant decrease at all. In fact, they tended to go up. Um, so in other words, the more you eat ice cream based milkshake, the less you're going to get, uh, well actually I guess the more you overeat, the less reward you're going to get out of overeating palatable eat. Uh, palatable dense, energy dense foods. Um, so palatable food intake causes plasticity of DA receptors relative to isochloric intake of low fat, low sugar food. So this is a, an animal study that basically yoked the animals to eat the same number of calories and it provided really good evidence that it's actually intake of energy dense food, not just intake of the overall number of calories that derails our reward circuitry. Um, so we decided to test whether frequency of ice cream consumption correlates negatively with reward region response to chocolate milkshake. Because if it follows that the more you eat a particular food, the less it recruits your reward circuitry upon eating, you should see a negative correlation. And that's exactly what we found, is that ice cream intake inversely correlated with response to milkshake taste in the striatum in several different regions, and it was pretty robust findings. Um, so kids who never eat ice cream all the time, or never eat ice cream, it's very orgasmic when they get a chocolate milkshake, whereas if they eat ice cream all the time, it doesn't really recruit the reward circuitry. Um, so the data suggests that a weaker reward region response to pal palatable food is a result of overeating, not a cause. Um, yet it might maintain overeating. If you sort of decide to eat more and more because you're getting less reward out of it, it would make sense that you could see that um, serving as a maintenance process for overeating. Um, and it implies that some people may show greater reward um, region habituation um, that may increase risk for blunting of uh, dopamine circuitry. So these theory, this is the, the part where um, I think it's important to sort of look at whether there's individual differences in reward learning and reward habituation that sets the stage for the two abnormalities we see related to obesity here, um, and then test whether individual differences predict future weight gain. Because I think just assuming that everybody experiences the same effect from an unhealthy diet is uh, misguided. So we did a paradigm where we um, basically gave people chocolate milkshake in the scanner, and there would be geometric shapes that were randomly assigned to different flavors. So in this particular example, if you saw a diamond, half the time you'd get a chocolate milkshake, and half the time you wouldn't. 
If you saw another shape, uh, square, you might, um, half the time you get the tasteless solution and the other half the time you wouldn't. And this allowed us to look at um, learning as it occurs in the scanner. And it was, um, this is sort of post hoc analysis of this data, but um, I think it's pretty interesting. So um, this is a picture of what happens. This is the increase in the response to the cue. So as you learn that a diamond says you're about to get chocolate milkshake, you get more and more throttle response to the cue as it comes up. So this is that reward learning part, reward cue learning. And that's a, it's a pretty linear fashion. It sort of dips down because of neural adaptation. Um, but you can graph this out over time. So basically, in a nutshell, people generally show an increase in response to the cues in terms of straddle response. So they're learning that these geometric shapes signal that they're about to get chocolate milkshake. And simultaneously, they show a reduction in straddle response to receipt of this milkshake. So this is akin to centrally specific satiety. The more you eat a particular food, the more you get sick of it. In these studies, we're only giving people a small amount of chocolate milkshake, so it's not like they're having a, a large quantity of it, it's just um, a couple cc's, so it's not really the same habituation that you might think about. But what's really interesting is that the people who show the, the reward cue learning propensity and the people who show the reward habituation propensity are totally different people. The correlation between those two groups is very, very small, it's basically zero. But more importantly, well, there's some pictures for you if you're really into brain imaging where you can actually see the increase in response to the cue with the color, more color representing a stronger response and the decrease in response to receipt over time. But those are hard to make out. Um, the important part of this is that there's predictive effects of this. So if you show um, a greater propensity for reward cue learning, you're more likely to gain more weight over time. And this is a correlation of 0.39, which is pretty respectable if you're trying to predict obesity. Um, and even more important is the more you show a reduction, this reward habituation or the reward receipt habituation, the more likely you are to gain weight. And that's a correlation of 0.69, which is really pretty large for the obesity risk factor literature. So put, to put that in context, um, the average effects of 0.49 correlate pretty well with um, future weight gain relative to the predictive effects for kind of reward region responsivity, which was sort of the findings I talked about earlier. And other biological things like resting metabolic rate, uh, doubly labeled water assessment of total energy intake, parental obesity. And this is a, a thing that really surprised me is that smoking cessation in a whole bunch of big risk factor studies has been the most potent predictor of future weight gain. So even compared to that, um, the predictive effects are quite large. So maybe we're onto something that's useful. Um, so the results provide novel evidence that there's individual differences in reward cue learning and reward habituation, uh, that they both predict future weight gain if you have a greater propensity, and that they're uncorrelated, suggesting the idea that there may be two qualitatively distinct pathways to obesity that we've not really figured out so far. Um, and I wanted to finally uh, close by talking about some efforts to kind of figure out how we can modulate this abnormal re neural responsivity. So we're testing whether reducing hyper-responsivity of reward regions to food cues and increasing reward region response to food receipt, tastes, prevents unhealthy weight gain. So the two questions we're trying to tackle are, can we change neural responsivity through uh, cognitive intervention or therapy? And if so, does it um, produce um, a weight gain prevention effect? So we piloted um, a study that had, or an intervention that had two components. One was a cognitive reappraisal intervention. Um, a lot of work by Hetty Kober and some other individuals in the field have found that um, if you ask people to think about the long-term health consequences of food when they're about to eat the food, it re reduces reward region response. Um, so that's, that's good, and it increases inhibitory regions because inhibitory regions um, are the breaks for our reward regions. So getting an increased inhibitory region response would be a good thing too. And we know that individuals uh, sort of characterized that obese versus lean individuals show greater responsivity of reward regions and less responsivity of inhibitory control regions, which I didn't talk about, but trust me, they're there. Um, and the, if, if we could get kids to use these procedures, it should hopefully reduce craving from high fat uh, sugar food stimuli when they're confronted with acues and produce uh, weight loss or prevent weight gain. Um, the other part is um, goal reframing. Well, that's, so we, we talk about this as goal reframing. So instead of saying how to make your brain not value tasty foods, we say how can you reorient yourself to pursue other goals that are important. The hedonic pleasure is a goal, but living a long life with uh, free of disease and illness is one would argue an even better goal than hedonic pleasure, which is transient. But anyway, um, we have them think about the health benefits of not eating unhealthy foods, 
the health costs of eating unhealthy foods, and the health benefits of eating healthy foods, and the health costs of not eating healthy foods. So anyway, there's a, a potpourri of different uh, reappraisal strategies that kids could use depending on what they resonated with. And we had them practice with food pictures, slides of foods that we show up on the um, uh, a screen, and then with real foods that we bring in, and you know, they would reappraise unhealthy foods and throw it in the trash if they were not supposed to eat it and reappraise the healthy foods and then they get to eat the foods. They actually really liked it. Um, the kids had a pretty good time in this session. Um, the other thing we did was try to do some palate retraining and this was much more of a just a total whim on my part to try to, to get at this and it's the idea of can we change taste preferences so that people avoid the blunting of reward region response to palatable foods. So in other words, if you can kind of get people to turn down the overall fat and sugar load in the diet, will it make them more enjoy these foods more and not have this blunted response that might result in compensatory overeating? So some of the examples of this are changing from frappuccino to coffee, which has considerably less sugar, um, use eating um, low-fat yogurt instead of ice cream. So it really wasn't like you should be deprived, but you should just kind of reduce the overall fat and sugar load in their diet. Um, and it was all participant-driven behavioral changes. We don't tell them what to do. We have them select it, which helps a bit. Um, so in this randomized pilot trial, we compared this mining health intervention um, that I just described to uh, a project health intervention, which is a cognitive dissonance-based, um, I won't get into these details. We compared it to two other active interventions, so it's a pretty rigorous test, and then an educational video control condition that said eat more vegetables and fruit and less fat. Um, so the subset of, there's also a subset of mining health um, participants and control participants who completed an fMRI scan when we looked at response to uh, unhealthy food images and receipt of chocolate milkshake. And what we found, um, I sort of think of this as a glass, a little bit less than half full, so I thought this was a failure, but it's, it's maybe we're working in the right direction. Um, but the intervention actually produced a nice increase in um, when we'd show people pictures of unhealthy foods, um, the, there is much greater activation of inferior frontal cortex, which is a, um, it's an important uh, inhibitory control region in the brain. So inhibitory regioning, region responsivity went up, and that was encouraging. And there was also an effect um, in sort of a brain region that the ACC, which is re related to attention and expectation. So we saw a decrease in that. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't, uh, we didn't see a lot of other reward region response, so we you know, got some encouraging effects, but not as many as we'd like. Um, and these findings do converge with some new evidence from uh, biofeedback uh, that Luke Stuckel at Harvard has done that also found that you can uh, reduce responsivity or increase responsivity of inhibitory control regions. Um, and parenthetically, in the paradigm, we didn't tell people on the scanner to use the cognitive reappraisal strategies. We just banked on them using it because we tra uh, trained them to use them in the intervention. So this is a fairly uh, conservative test. Um, the lack of increased responsivity of, um, to receipt, we didn't find any evidence of change in receipt, was probably due to the specificity. You know, we just gave them chocolate milkshake in the scanner and most people were not overeating a lot of chocolate milkshake in our study. Um, but the more important point is, in terms of change in percent body fat, we got a significantly greater reduction in percent body fat over time relative to our control condition um, with this cognitive reappraisal intervention. So it did produce some nice behavioral changes. This is objectively measured body fat, so it's a nice objective outcome, not self -report, subject to self-report bias. Um, and there was some evidence that it beat out several alternative interventions. So um, again, the glass is about half full, it's sort of encouraging, but I think we need to figure out how to do reappraisal training much more effectively. Um, so the intervention translates into medium effect size. Um, it was bigger than a lot of uh, the average obesity prevention programs, which have been pretty abysmal, so that's not really saying much. Um, and participants did seem to enjoy the intervention and that they actually came back to multiple sessions, which doesn't always happen. So in conclusion, um, high fat and sugar foods um, engage reward circuitry like drugs, increasing the likelihood of chronic overeating, elevate a reward region responsivity to food, and cue reward learning propensity and reward habituation propensity, all increase risk for future um, obesity, suggesting important individual difference factors. Um, so avoiding habitual high fat, high sugar food intake is, is more difficult for some individuals. Um, so I think we should be asking ourselves, what can we do to help these people avoid habitual overeating? Um, and here are just a few policy thoughts, which I think run counter to a lot of the thoughts that we've just heard, which are very good thoughts. Um, but trying to improve our food environment by re reducing access to unhealthy foods. If you just have healthy food options, 
it's easy to make a healthy food choice. Um, improving opportunities for exercise is really important. As we have you know, see, at least in the United States, physical education classes have been cut and access to kind of parks and other places where you can exercise are often limited in, in poor, uh, impoverished neighborhoods, for example. We should improve food offerings at schools and in the home, offering only healthy options. I know that it says only there. Um, sounds a little or Orwellian. Um, we should reduce the omnipresent food cues, so unhealthy food commercials that trigger overeating. This is pretty powerful. Like We're definitely making it a lot harder for a lot of people in the world by showing them pictures of all these unhealthy foods all the time because they then eat. Um, and I think we should disseminate the most effective obesity prevention programs and not rely on treatment. We know that treatment really doesn't work very well. Um, a period of overeating begets all these changes in your gut peptides and your brain, um, your metabolism, all this stuff that makes it very hard to ever return to a healthy body weight and stay there. So I think prevention is going to be much more, op uh, I'm more optimistic about prevention. So I want to thank uh, the folks in my lab who helped with all this research and thank you for your attention.